today's first topic is transactions. So all of you know about transactions, I'm sure. What is it? It's a unit of a program execution that accesses data and may update data also. And there's a stereotypical transaction which everybody is familiar with, which reads something and updates something. And if you see here, it's very abstract. It says read A, A equal to A minus 50, write A, read B, B equal to B plus 50, write B. It's transferring 50 units of currency from A to B. Now this is abstract. Now this is not how you communicate with the database. How do you communicate with the database? You write SQL queries. You'll say select something from the database uh, where uh, account number equal to so and so. And then in your program, you'll get the value and then subtract 50 from it. And then you'll have a query, uh, an update query. It says update uh, account set uh, balance equal to so and so, where account number equal to so and so. So the read and the write are done through SQL queries. Now, this is a level of detail which uh, we will ignore when we talk of transaction processing. In the abstract, you're reading something, you're writing something. What are you reading? You're reading some particular account number. We are just abstracting it away here. We're saying you're reading A, writing A, reading B, writing B. A and B are some things. In the abstract level, we don't care about what exactly they are, uh, how the query is issued, and so forth. So it, it always helps when you're looking at something complex to abstract away details, simplify it, and then it will let you focus on the hard aspects of what you're looking at. So now, why is the notion of transaction important? Um, the main issues are twofold. One is that there may be failures. What if a system dies in the middle? Now, in the old days, uh, IIT had a Fox Pro uh, database system, which was not very good about these things. So anytime there was a power failure, after that, somebody had to go manually rebuild indices, do some other stuff. It wasn't too bad, it didn't lose data. But it would lose indices, and then you have to go manually drop indices, rebuild them uh, before the system was even usable. So failure in that system could lead to an inconsistent state. Now what about modern databases? They will run recovery, they will come back up. But if you had a transaction that had started doing something and had not finished, obviously, if you had not used the notion of a transaction, if, for example, from JDBC, you did not turn off auto commit. You might have executed the first query and not the second. So you might have left it in an inconsistent state. And so as a programmer, you have to be aware of it. But here the focus is on what does the database have to do if you did say that uh, turn off auto commit, issue some statements, and then you say commit or you say abort, or the system crashes in the middle. What should the database do? And that is a recovery subsystem. And that's actually something we'll look at later. But before that, we will deal with concurrent executions of transactions. And here, it's actually, this is actually a lot more complex than recovery in some sense, because uh, first of all, concurrency can happen in fairly complex ways. And dealing with it is not necessarily easy. So there are some uh, brute force solutions to deal with it, which is uh, one example is, say, prevent any concurrent executions. Make all transactions run serially, one at a time. How do you do it? You can have some kind of locks. Transaction comes in, it gets a lock on the database, it does whatever it wants to do, it releases a lock, and only then the next transaction can come in. So you can run transactions serially. That's possible. But it's a bad idea in general. There are some special cases where this is actually a good idea. In particular, main memory databases with very short transactions, turns out that running it serially can sometimes beat doing concurrency control. But in almost all situations, running transactions serially is a bad idea. So what could the reasons be? Performance, right? If you are waiting in a queue, and somebody ahead of you in the queue is taking a, has a very, very big transaction. You're in a shop, that person has bought 1,000 items and is taking a long time. If you have to wait behind that person, then you're going to get very bored. You would rather have multiple um, people in the shop who can, one of who can be processing that person, other can be 
processing you. So you want concurrency for performance to avoid long waits. Now, uh, once you allow concurrency, the issue is that two transactions can read and write the same data items. So now what does it mean for a particular execution to be correct or not correct? Okay. So this is actually a very difficult question in the abstract. Now all of you who are familiar with the transaction concept would have seen the definitions. But if you think about it, it's not obvious. Okay. So if you just think, uh, ask somebody who is not aware of this, get, grab a student who doesn't know these concepts and say, hey, these things can run concurrently. What does it mean for a particular execution to even be correct? How do you know it is correct or it had a problem? Okay, this is a deep question. And this is a question which uh, other communities outside of databases usually punted on. They said, we will, uh, operating systems would say, we will give you semaphores, you do what you want. It's your headache. The database system people said, no, no, that is not good enough. We cannot dump this on the programmer. We have to understand what is the right thing and how to control concurrency such that bad things don't happen. So that's the whole issue of concurrency control. So sticking with this example of reading A and updating, subtracting from A, and then adding that to B. Atomicity requirement, uh, if, if, it, if this sequence fails after three, but before four, you've subtracted from A, but not updated B, you've lost 50 rupees from the account. That's not acceptable. Durability is once you have finished the whole transaction, you've updated A and B, the database is not allowed to forget about it. If it forgets, then a user who has transferred the money is going to be very upset. So that is durability. And the third is consistency. Uh, so what is consistency? That's actually a little hard to pin down in general. It's, it is dependent on the application. But for a financial application, one of the notions of consistency is that you cannot create or destroy money. You can transfer money, but you can't create it. You can receive money from somebody else, and then you record that you got money into the system. You can hand out cash from some, to somebody. You record that you handed cash out of the system. But you cannot create or destroy money. That's the uh, reserve of the Reserve Bank of India and of uh, finance ministers who can goad them to do so. Actually, in the olden days, uh, governments could just go print money. Go tell the printing press, print so much money. Okay, today it's harder. Uh, there have been some checks put in place to make this harder. So what does the government do instead? It goes borrows money. So uh, there's a very interesting uh, book on the history of money by Neil Ferguson. Any of you have seen the book? It's a nice book. Uh, it traces back the history, not of money per se. Money is a very old concept. But of the modern banking systems. Uh, which traced back to Italy, where there was a lot of small city-states which needed money to fight wars. And they borrowed money from uh, you know, merchants, and then the merchants ended up creating banks. Anyway, so uh, from there uh, came these modern concepts, so you, you cannot just go create money. So anyway, coming back to our uh, application, the notion of consistency is dependent on the particular application. And what each transaction has to ensure is that it will not violate consistency. Now, there are some things you can do as a, a database designer to uh, include integrity constraints. So if a, a primary key is violated, the database will roll it back. But there is a limit to this, uh, to the kinds of things you can do with foreign key, primary key. For example, uh, having a constraint that the total amount of money cannot change cannot be imposed through a uh, SQL integrity constraint. So that is something the application has to take care of. And the database system cannot do anything about it. However, um, what the database system can ensure is that the transactions see a consistent state. What do I mean by this? Supposing you had concurrent executions. Now, uh, look at point at the point between step three and step four there. 
Is the consistency constraint that the total amount of money is conserved, is it satisfied at that point? It isn't. You have subtracted 50, you have not yet added the 50 in the other place. So that integrity constraint has actually been temporarily violated. Now if a transaction sees a state where it has already been violated, it is going to lead to a state where it is still violated. Okay, so what we are going to insist is not that the end state always be correct, but the requirement is that if the starting state is consistent, a transaction must always leave the database in a final state which is consistent. It cannot make it inconsistent. So if you run one transaction after the other serially, at every point that after each transaction, the database will again be consistent. So uh, th that's what the system should ensure. But the problem that can occur is because of concurrent execution. Uh, for example, here, uh, the same transaction. At this point, three, another transaction came in and it reads A and B and prints A plus B. Now, supposing these are the only two accounts in the bank, you know what the sum of it, uh, the two was before. But if this transaction sees the intermediate state, it's going to see an inconsistent state. So the isolation requirement is that no transaction should be able to see an intermediate state like this. So putting these together, you have the acid properties, atomicity, uh, consistency, isolation, and durability. Now isolation, it turns out, is surprisingly hard to pin down precisely. What is isolation? It's not running them serially, that's too strong. Running them serially ensures isolation of one transaction from another because there is no concurrent activity, but that is too strong. Now, some people might say that two-phase locking is a requirement for isolation. That is also too strong. There are other protocols that um, you know, ensure that nothing goes wrong, but they don't follow two-phase locking. So what is isolation? How do you define this property independent of specific concurrency control mechanisms? So it's actually a little tricky and hard to define, uh, but one fairly uh, weak, but probably a necessary condition is for every pair of transactions, TI and TJ, it appears to TI that either TJ finished execution before TI started, or TJ started execution after TI finished. So if you take any pair of transactions, Either it should appear to have gone in this way or in that way. If you take a pair of transactions and, and they, you can figure out that they ran concurrently, not like this or like that, then there is a problem. So that is the, uh, that's a very basic notion of isolation. What this doesn't say is what if there are multiple transactions. There are three transactions. This doesn't actually prevent, you know, if A, B, C, A thinks B is after it, B thinks C is after it, C thinks A is after it. Okay, so it's a little too weak actually. Uh, but if you make it stronger, uh, you get into trouble. So this definition is from a book by uh, Gray and Reuter, which is considered the Bible of transaction processing. Um, Jim Gray got the ACM Turing Award, which is the equivalent of the Nobel Prize uh, for his work on transaction processing. He is known as the father of transaction processing. Okay. So uh, the transaction state, what is a transaction is active, it's running. At some point, the transaction says, I'm done. Please commit the updates which I've done. So when you, in JDBC, you say connection.commit, at that point, the transaction is partially committed. But it's not done yet. The database has to do some more work before it can ensure the uh, updates are durable. So uh, if it does not come to this state, at some point, it may say abort. The connection may say connection.abort, at which point it is in a failed state. So, uh, but it can also be in a failed state because power went off, the computer crashed, and so on. Now, a failed state is still inconsistent. Things are not yet cleaned up. So from a failed state, you should clean up, and after that, the transaction has been rolled back, and it's aborted. It's, you cleaned up after it. Or, the, uh, you said commit the transaction. It was in a partially committed state. The database took some actions to um, make sure the updates are safe on disk or wherever else, and after that it is in committed state. So this is the abstract notion of what a transaction goes through, the life cycle of a transaction. 
So if you see this diagram, it can go from active to partially committed or failed. Now, what is less obvious is from partially committed, you might go to the failed state because the database may crash after the transaction says, please commit, but before it has done whatever is required to commit the transaction. So coming back, um, why concurrent executions? Uh, there are two primary reasons, both performance related. The first one is increased processor and disk utilization. And this is particularly important these days because a typical computer system has many processors. Each processor has multiple cores. Okay, uh, we already have uh, four cores on mobile phones now. And processors may have eight, uh, 16, even 64 cores are on the way. And then you have multiple CPUs. And then you have disks, multiple disks on a machine. And then you may have multiple memory banks which can be independently accessed. So there's a lot of scope for parallelism within a single computer. And if you run things serially, you're wasting all this. But if you can run transactions concurrently, one of them can be using one CPU, the other can be using a second CPU, a third can be using disk one, a fourth disk two, and so on. So up to some point, having more concurrent transactions will give you better performance. But beyond a point, the whole place gets too crowded, the transactions are pushing and shoving at each other, waiting for each other, and then there is chaos. So you don't want to go to that point. Uh, but you want a good degree of concurrency. And the second issue is average response time. Even if you had just a single processor, nothing else is, nothing is really running concurrently. If you have to wait behind somebody else in the queue, you're going to be upset. But can you quantify what is happening in the system? Okay, upset is a vague uh, human-oriented term. Can you quantify what is happening? And you quantify it by average response time. What is the average response time? Uh, transaction is submitted to the point where it is completed and the user is told, fine, you're, it's true. Well, the database part, we don't worry about the application here. The transaction arrives at the database and it completes. That is the response time for that transaction. So if you have exactly one processor and sequential execution of things, if there's even one large job, Many small jobs may be waiting behind it. And they all wait as much as the time as the long job takes to finish. Even though these were small jobs, their average waiting time became very big. In contrast, if you have a, one long job and many small jobs, if you can somehow interleave these in between, while the big uh, thing is running, the small things can come, finish up, and go away. You temporarily stop the big guy. Okay? Preemptive scheduling. So you can preempt the big task, allow small guys to go in. So immediately, the waiting time for the small guys comes down drastically, and the average waiting time will go down drastically. So that's the second very important reason. So we'll uh, look at how uh, to control the concurrency to prevent problems. But before that, we have to understand what are the kinds of problems that can arise, and what does it mean to say that there is no problem, first of all. For this, uh, there is an abstraction which called schedule, which again you must be familiar with. What is a schedule? It's a sequence of things which a transaction does. Now what do we mean by instructions? You can look at it in terms of SQL and the um, expressions that are evaluated inside the application program and so forth. Here is a slightly abstracted transaction which reads A, subtracts 50 from A and reads B. This is the one we saw. And one more transaction, which reads A, computes 10% of A, and subtracts that from A, and then adds that value to B. So here we are seeing what is going on inside the transaction. Now the problem is, if you have any uh, notion of concurrency control, which depends on what is going on inside the transaction, then you need to know what is happening inside the application in general. There are ways around it. For example, if these operations, addition uh, of um, amount or uh, any other such thing is done in the database and you know what is going on, you can do a little bit more. But in general, this computation may be happening outside the database. So the application reads a value, does something, writes a value. 
So all the concurrency control schemes, at least the basic ones, there are some more advanced ones which take into account what exactly is happening, that it's adding money. It's not doing something random, it is adding $50 or rupees to the account. So then you can actually modify how you do concurrency control. But uh, initially at least, we'll assume we don't know what is going on. All we know is there was a read of A, followed by a write of A, followed by a read of B, followed by a write of B. We're going to ignore what happened in between. So this is the part which the database can see. So that is the uh, abstraction of a schedule which the basic concurrency control techniques work with. Um, so now a schedule is simply a sequence of instructions. And so this is a schedule. So it, the schedule shows one more thing. Not only is the sequence for a transaction, it shows how the instructions for two transactions were interleaved. Now there is a basic assumption here when we show schedules like this, that a one single instruction here is atomic. That is, a read and a write don't happen at the same time. Okay, so that's a simplifying assumption. They can actually occur at the same time, uh, but the concurrency control techniques will make sure that if they occur at the same time, they don't conflict with each other. If they conflict with each other in some way, they will not actually occur concurrently. So for the purpose of the schedule, we are simplifying the whole thing. We're going to assume they happen one after the other. In reality, in the database or in, on the computer, some of these may be happening concurrently, but we will arbitrarily pretend one happened after the other or the other way if they did not interact in any way. If one of them read A, the other wrote B, it doesn't matter. If they happen concurrently, we can treat it as this way or as that way, we don't care. The result is the same. So we are basically making that assumption when we say uh, schedule is a sequence of steps. Now here is another schedule for the same pair of transactions, which is flipped. What is the difference between this and this? This came down and that went up. Now what is the final state of the database after this? In the first case, uh, you transferred 50 and then transferred 10%. In the second case, you transfer 10% and then you transfer 50. The final result is not the same. Right? Here, 10% is before subtracting 50. In the other case, it's after subtracting 50. So five rupees difference will be there between what you transfer in these two cases. So the final result of the two schedules is different. But does that mean one of the schedules is wrong and the other is right? No. Both are correct. Depends on the order in which they were submitted. Uh, it may happen that uh, two people submitted these more or less at the same time and the database chose one or the other. And if in the external world, the person who came in first was T1 and T2 came behind him in the queue, they were waiting in the queue and they were, T1 knows he got in first and then T2 came in, but the final result uh, shows T2 happened first and then T1. If they were buying tickets, they may be very upset. So I got in first, you gave him the ticket. But you don't know. If they're on two separate counters, you don't know. So it's okay, they're happy. It's not incorrect. The real world notion of time doesn't matter here. When they arrived, when they were told they are done, doesn't really matter. Now here's a third schedule where the instructions are broken up differently and in this case, the transactions are not serial. In the previous case, they were serial, one after the other. Here they are concurrent. So some part of T2 is running in the midst of some part of T1. Now, is this schedule safe or not? Clearly, some concurrent stuff is going on. That's, that does not mean it's wrong. But how do we know it is right or wrong? Is it safe or not? How do we know it? Okay. I think all of you, how many of you are already familiar with the notion of serializability? Okay. Not all of you, so let me spend a minute on this. The notion of serializability basically says that we will say that this kind of interleaved schedule is okay, provided it is equivalent in some sense to a serial schedule. Serial schedules we know are okay. The previous two are both serial. We know both are safe. They are uh, actually not concurrent. 
and so they are fine. If we can show that this is somehow equivalent to one of them, then this is also fine. So what do we mean by equivalent? Well, there are several different notions of equivalence, but at the core, what all should happen? The, if you read a value in both the schedules, you should read the same value. We might have printed it out to the user. If you did some updates, at the end of everything, the final result should be the same. So that's the basic notion of uh, equivalence, which is called view equivalence. Um, but from the viewpoint of concurrency control, usually something even simpler is used which is uh, conflict equivalence, and I'll come to that in a moment. But if you look here, uh, look at these two parts. This part and this part. This is working on A, this is working on B. Will they affect each other? No. They, in other words, these two, yeah. This set of instructions does not conflict with this set of instructions. But in fact, what is done is usually you take a pair of instructions at a time and say that this instruction does not conflict with that instruction because they operate on different data items, not on the same data. Okay, so what can you do? You can flip. So you can pretend that happened later and this happened earlier. Okay, so now you can do this again. What has happened? Read has moved up. What are the two adjacent instructions? A is A minus temp and B. Actually, uh, I, I told you earlier we are going to ignore the exact computations here. So let's actually do that. Shown here, but let's ignore it totally. So the next step is B and read A. Read B and read A. They don't conflict. Will read A and read A conflict? No. Both are reading A. If they happen in the other order, it doesn't matter. The result would be the same. So you can actually swap these things and move this whole, uh, you know, so let's just take the read and write here. You can move this read B above write A and read A and bring it up. Similarly, the write B can move above write A and read A and come to the top. So what have we landed up with? We have landed up with a serial schedule where T1 runs first and then T2 runs. So the two schedules are basically equivalent. Why? Because we have done a series of swaps each of the swaps we guarantee preserves equivalence. In what sense? They don't affect each other. So whatever they read in each case will be exactly the same. Okay. So uh, we are swapping things which do not conflict. And this notion is known as conflict equivalence. I I'll come back to it in a few slides. But before we uh, see that, we have to understand when things are not actually equivalent. So here is one more schedule which reads A, it has not yet written A, and meanwhile the other guy comes in and reads A, updates it, and then this writes A. What is going to happen here? Something very bad. The write which this transaction T2 did here is going to be clobbered by the write done by this guy. It will write some old value back, some other value. The old value minus 50 is what it writes back. The Subtracting 10% of A has got wiped out of the database. Clearly, this is the kind of problems due to concurrency which we do not want to allow. So let's verify that this schedule is not conflict equivalent to any serial schedule. If it is, then we have a problem. It cannot be, right? If you ran one after the other, in either case, the total amount of money is conserved. But if you do this, A is updated in a bad way and the total amount of money is not conserved here. That's easy to verify. So is it uh, conflict equivalent to any serial schedule? So let's see if we can um, pull T2 down. So now here is a right A and here is a right A. This cannot go below this, okay? So you cannot swap it. So it's not actually um, conflict equivalent. In, in you, you cannot swap it. So you cannot move T2 down. Can you move T2 up? That's the other option. Then it will be equivalent to the schedule where T2 is first and then T1. Can you move T2 up? Unfortunately, there's a 
write B and write B here, those cannot be swapped. So T2 cannot be moved up, it cannot be moved down. Either way, there is, if you swap some of those instructions, the result will be different. So what we can infer is that this particular schedule is not actually equivalent to either T1, T2 or T2, T1. So it's not equivalent to any serial schedule. In this case, there are only two possible serial schedules, T1, T2 or T2, T1. It's not, this schedule is not serializable. So this brings up the notion of serializability. Uh, concurrent schedule is serializable if it is equivalent to a serial schedule. And there are these two notions which I told you about, conflict and view. Again, I'm not going to cover view here. There's some discussion in the book. Uh, conflict serializability is what we are going to look at. And as I told you, we're going to ignore all operations other than read and write. Now, I told you informally that things don't conflict under certain circumstances. So here is um, what it is. Supposing you have instructions ii and ij of transactions ti and tj. So if the first one is read queue, the other one is also read queue, they don't conflict. If one of them is read and the other is write on the same thing, then they do conflict. If the write and was followed by the read, it will read the value which is written. If you swap it, it will read an old value. So they conflict. Similarly, write and read conflict, write and write conflict. But if they're on two separate data items, it doesn't matter. Write and read of data item A does not affect data item B. So if they're on different data items, they don't conflict. And a conflict forces a logical order between the two. If it happened this way in the schedule, in any equivalent schedule, it must happen in the same order. So uh, t if uh, T1 did something before T2 which conflicts, in any serial schedule, T1 must be before T2. That's the basic idea. So if a schedule can be transformed into another schedule as by a series of swaps of non-conflicting instructions, we say they are conflict equivalent. So this is what I explained earlier. And a schedule is conflict serializable if it is conflict equivalent to a serial schedule. So all this is basic stuff. Um, so we have uh, another concurrent case. This one is read A, write A. Uh, well, it's actually the same one we saw before, um, where these pair of instructions can be swapped, meaning pulled up above these, and you get this one. So three is conflict serializable. We don't know what is happening in between, but what is important to notice, I don't care what is happening in between. This will hold regardless. The application might have computed something very complex in between these two, doesn't matter. It will still be serializable. Any questions here? And uh, there is also one more notion of recoverability, um, which basically is illustrated here. Supposing you had this schedule, T8 read and wrote A, then T9 read A, supposing it could read the value written by T8, and it commits. But after this, T8 does some more operations, it might be forced to abort. Maybe the system crashes. T8 did not complete, it's going to be rolled back. But now, unfortunately, T9 has seen something which T8 wrote, and even if it is serializable, it is not recoverable. At this point, if the database crashes, you have a situation where T9 has seen a state which is then rolled back, so it is not recoverable. So you don't want such schedules. So not only should it be serializable, it should be recoverable. And then there's, um, for lack of time, I'm going to skip this stuff about cascading and so on. You, if you don't know about it, you can read it up later. Uh, but the important thing to notice that you, you should ensure recoverability. And in fact, there's other prop property of cascadeless schedules. If you know about it, it's fine. It's preferable, but it's not essential. And the goal is concurrency control protocols, which ensure this. Now, serializability is the gold standard. But it turns out that for performance reasons, databases will actually never enforce serializability unless you specifically ask for it. In fact, it's quite bad. 
the default level, even if you say begin transaction commit, it turns out that most database systems today will not ensure serializability. What are they doing? Their concurrency control protocols, you know, serializability has a cost. So what many database uh, implementers decided is that if you really need serializability, you will ask for it. If you don't ask for it, you don't really need it. And they will do stuff which results in non-serializable executions. Which, as an academic who has learned the whole theory of serializability, will say, but why are you doing that? Isn't it illegal? Shouldn't they be put in jail or something? Okay. So the answer is, um, you know, you get, uh, so, so this, this is a market, right? In the stock market, you, you, know, you get what you ask for. And uh, if you are not careful, if you don't read the fine print, you're toast. So in, in this case, the fine print in all databases is that, by default, they do not ensure serializability. And you need to know this fine print. If you don't know and naively assume it ensures serializability, you're in trouble. And in the lab session, you'll be trying this out. So how do you tell the database uh, be serializable? There's a command in most databases. In PostgreSQL, there's a set serialization level uh, to serializable, uh, set consistency level to serializable. Um, and you have to execute that, or you have to configure the database. So there's usually a config file where you can set this option. So one of the two has to be done. Now, why would you want to allow weak level of serializability? And wouldn't it always result in problems? And the answer is no. Many times it doesn't really result in problems. There are many cases where when people read uh, information from a database, in particular uh, things which read a lot of data, they don't really care for accurate statistics. If you uh, say how much money does the bank have, if you run this query while updates are going on, you know very well that there may be some updates which you missed. If you really want a consistent view, you should do it differently. How much money does the bank have should be checked by seeing all transactions uh, that happen before some time are included and transactions that happen after that time are not included. That's a logical way to deal with it. If you, you can do that always. You can run a query which asks for only updates that happen before this time and then add those up and get what you want. Uh, but if you just read the balances in the accounts and just add it up, you know that you're getting a potentially inconsistent state. That's fine. So you can live with it. Uh, and then there are other things like statistics used for query optimization. If they're slightly off, it doesn't matter. It's not like the query execution plan chosen will be totally different. It's likely to be the same thing. So the default is weak level of serializability. So there are, the SQL standard actually defines these levels, which a database can, uh, should support. So the lowest level is read uncommitted. You can read anything, including uncommitted records. Okay. So that's the worst level. Many applications don't want such a bad thing where you can read uncommitted updates. The next level up is read committed. What does this ensure? If you read a value, you will only see a value which is committed. If another transaction is, has updated it but has not committed it, you won't see the value. You might have to wait, so the locking protocols will make you wait. Some other protocols will give you an old value, but regardless, you can only see committed values. So most databases actually run at this level. Read committed is the default level. So what does read committed not guarantee? That's the next step up, repeatable read. So what is repeatable read? If you read a particular item once, and then after some time in the same transaction, read it again. If the system guarantees you will see the same value, that is a repeatable read. But in read committed, the system does not guarantee it. So you can say, read the account balance for account 321, and after some time in the same transaction, say, read the balance again, it might have changed. What has happened? The first time you read it, some transaction had committed, you see the committed value. Before the next time you executed, another transaction came, updated it, went committed and went away, and you're seeing the new committed value. OK, 
Okay, so this can happen with read committed. The repeatable read level says this problem cannot occur. But is this good enough? Is this the same as serializability? Serializability is the gold standard. It's not. So you can have schedules which ensure repeatable read but are not serializable. So serializable is the, uh, and actually this slide has a mistake. It says it's the default. Um, and it's the default in the standard. So the slide is technically correct, but it's misleading. The standard says serializable should be the default. But if, uh, and the slide says below, some databases do not ensure serializable schedules by default. It shouldn't be some, it should be all. Okay, all the common databases run at uh, read committed. Nobody runs at serializable by default. And in particular, uh, Oracle and PostgreSQL uh, do something different from these levels. Uh, read committed is their default, but they also support something else called snapshot isolation, which it turns out is not quite one of these levels. Um, and PostgreSQL versions up to 9.2 uh, use the old level, uh, 9 point, up to 9.0 use this thing called snapshot isolation which is, does not guarantee serializability. Oracle also, as far as I know, still does that. And what is worse is, if you tell Oracle or the old versions of PostgreSQL saying, set the consistency level to serializable, they'll say, sure. But then underneath, they do something else called snapshot isolation, which is not serializable. So in spite of doing everything right, the database will cheat you. So that, that in some sense, is really cheating. Because you asked for serializability, they said fine, but it's not. Okay, so they, they are lying. They were lying. Uh, Postgres eventually decided uh, they shouldn't be doing this. And uh, they implemented as of 9.1, which was released in 2012, I think, or 2011. They released a version, uh, which is a new protocol called uh, serializable snapshot isolation, which actually ensures serializability. So they have corrected it now. Oracle, as far as I know, has not yet corrected that problem. This is an interesting, uh, uh, so just to jump ahead, you know, what is research, right? So this was a nice piece of research. Uh, there's a person called Alan Fekete who has visited us. We've, we've done some other research with him on snapshot isolation. He and his PhD student worked out a way to easily change the PostgreSQL's concurrency control mechanism to ensure serializability. And they published a paper and then it got implemented in PostgreSQL line. It's now released, so that's very nice. Okay, and that's it for this chapter.